Okay, I think we're going to get going here this morning. I hope everyone else who's registered can join us as we begin. Welcome once again. My name is Gina Clonan. I'm the founding president of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. For nearly three decades, the Hall has worked to discover and share the stories of women. Our various educational platforms acknowledge the individual and collective feminine voice. This will be a half hour intimate and informative chat, followed by 15 minutes of your questions, which I encourage you to submit at any time by simply clicking the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Our goal is simple, a virtual gathering to talk about today's important issues. We also hope this will be a useful source of information while offering up helpful takeaways. We are so honored today to have as our guest an internationally respected business leader whose personal journey in and out of the office, as told in her acclaimed New York Times bestselling book, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future, is one that offers inspiration and hope for all. She's been an influencer long before the internet created that identity. Please welcome our very own 2015 inductee, Indra Nui. Great to be here, Gina. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today, and let's get right into it. You're a woman, a person of color, and an immigrant. In what ways did those identities for or against you work for or against you, and how did they shape your character? Huh. You know, I'd say at the time that I came to the United States, which was way back in 1980, uh, or 78 rather, uh, I was the only one of its kind uh, hovering in the halls of corporate America, if you want to put it that way. There weren't too many immigrants from emerging markets, a person of color uh, in consulting, or moving up in the corporate world. So in some ways, I was viewed as an oddity. And people so always wondered what I would have to offer them, especially if I sat around uh, in a boardroom or a place where powerful people got together. It was also a time when the world of work was defined by men, white men, because that's what the times were those days. Um, I never had a peer who was a woman who I worked directly with. I never had a boss who was a woman. And so, um, all my mentors were men, and that's the environment I was growing up in. I have to tell you that it worked against me because I had to earn my stripes. People always wondered what my value add would be in that job or that assignment or whatever. So I had to earn my stripes. So I worked extra, extra hard to make sure that I proved to people that an immigrant, person of color, woman, whatever it is, look beyond that. Look at the quality of the work I'm going to produce. So I really worked very hard to demonstrate that I could add value way more than anybody else could. But I would also say to you, if I was thinking honestly about those days, it also worked in favor of me. I'll tell you why. I was so different and people had not seen somebody like me. They gave me the benefit of doubt. And they sort of looked at me as, huh, who is she? Let's see what she's about. Let's give her a chance to talk. So I think in many ways, I was also given the benefit of the doubt. At the same time, I had this big question mark about why I was there. And I had to fight one and use the other as a tailwind to move ahead. Well, tailing on that, that phrase, benefit of the doubt, Isabel Wilkerson wrote a seminal book called Cast, comparing mm -hmm. American, Indian, and Nazi Germany's social structure. Wherein, and I quote her, cast is the granting of withholding of respect, status, honor, attention, privileges, resources, benefit of the doubt, and human kindness to someone based on their perceived rank <clears throat> standing in the hierarchy. It's often said that women worldwide are caste. You were born into a caste as a Brahmin. How did that affect and define your trajectory? Um, I'd say that I grew up confident because I never had to go through any sort of discrimination in the place where I was born. Because even in our family, women were treated as equals to the men. And we were encouraged to dream and soar and do whatever we wanted. So in, in our family, even though we were not wealthy people, uh, we were in an educated class. And basically in society, we were not discriminated against inside the home. The fact that we were women were never held against us. All that we were told was study hard, 
and you'll have freedom within a frame. You don't have unlimited freedom to do whatever you want. You still have to live within the norms of society. And so I think uh, it all worked in my favor. And I'll be honest with you, Gina, I'm the first person to tell you that if I was discriminated against, if I was held back because of my gender, if I wasn't allowed to be educated because of my gender, uh, that would have been terrible because I, I would not have been as, I would not, I would not have emerged as confident and, um, you know, uh, just full of life as I am today. Um, keeping just a couple of seconds more on the idea of immigrants. The U.S. Mm. has the largest number of any nation worldwide. In the newly passed health and climate bill, the Senate sent a clear message that hate and xenophobia have no place in our society by voting down every anti-immigrant amendment. What are your hopes for a sustainable immigrant policy? You know, immigration has become sort of a lightning rod these days. And uh, we have to think about immigration very, very clinically and dissected. So I think of immigration in four buckets. I think in the country, we need immigrants with talent. We need people who can uh, contribute to the country, you know, computer programmers, uh, you know, quantum, quantum physics people, people who work on artificial intelligence, machine learning, to really move the country forward from a science and technology perspective. So we need talent for that. And if we don't have enough within the country, we have to go out and get them. So if they come to our universities to be educated, we have to find a way to keep them. Because after all, we educated them. So that's the first group, highly talented immigrants, desperately needed to move our country forward and keep the intellectual property here. The second group, I think, are immediate family of, this, of these highly talented people. Because you don't want them to leave their families behind, their immediate family. Uh, and so you've got to find a way to get them to have a, you know, love for the US and to want to stay here. The third group is what I look at as guest workers, farm workers, nursing workers, teachers, caregivers, whatever. Wherever we have a shortage of labor and we need to bring in guest workers to fill those gaps. But on a very organized guest worker program. And the fourth group is what unfortunately is defining all of immigration. People who are fleeing persecution, who come to this country to get a better life because their life in their home countries are hopeless, all right? Unfortunately, those people who come to the border as migrants or whatever, define the whole immigration equation. Shouldn't be the case. I think we've got to look at those people and say, how can we make the countries that they're fleeing stronger? And how do we work hard to restore some rule of law and some order to the South American countries or whatever, as opposed to, holding these people as uh, criminals. They're more victims of a political system. So I think we should take out the first three buckets on immigration and talk about them in a very different way than we do this fourth bucket. That's, that's a very important um, way to look at it. Uh, I, and I would just add, would you also agree that we also have to look at our role in particularly in that fourth bucket, which many people will argue that by denying it, we make it the problem only of the countries in strife. Well, I'm sure a lot of countries have, you know, um, have to own the problems in many parts of the world. They go back decades and centuries. Uh, but at some point, I think the people who can make a difference should come together and talk about how to address the hopeless situation in some of these countries where in today's world, you cannot contain the problem in those countries. Right. These problems have no borders. They're yeah. either going to show up as migrants in Europe or in the US, because that's where the opportunity lies, or there's going to be disease in those countries that's going to spread to the rest of the world. So I think the time has come for a real discussion on the flashpoints in the world and how we can go and help those countries get back on their feet collectively. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, let's move from immigration now to women and work. Mm -hmm. In your book, you state a woman's choice to work outside the home is integral to their well-being and prosperity. Choice. It's a complicated word. 60% of American women work while the child and elder care crisis is keeping many more out of the workplace. You've expressed three important areas to address this situation. What are they? So, uh, you know, I think women are a potent talent pool. 
I just look at them as incredibly brilliant, driven, want freedom of the purse, want economic freedom. And I look at the numbers, 70% of high school valedictorians in our country are women. Women are getting 10% more college, 10 points more college degrees than men. There was even an article today, I think, or yesterday in one of the major uh, magazines which said that women are doing way better in college and school should men be held back? Should boys be held back a year so that they too can develop this drive? First time I've read this kind of an article. Uh, women are getting higher number of degrees in professional schools. So you've got this potent talent base, but we also want this talent base to contribute to the economy by engaging in paid work and also contribute to family building. Okay, so we want to put a lot of pressure on these women to do both. Okay. And so the only way we can keep our population growing and thriving is by allowing women to have families, but give them the infrastructure to do that, but at the same time, encouraging them to be in paid work and giving them the right uh, you know, support structures there. What's needed? We need maternity, paternity care, whether we like it or not. We need to encourage them to have kids because it's good for the country, but we have to make sure they have the time to give birth, nurture the child and the father to participate in the, in the birth of the child because family is not just female, family is family. Uh, the second thing is uh, flexibility or predictability at work. I think the wonderful thing about COVID, the only silver lining is now taught us what hybrid could be like. It's given a blueprint now for how to work flexibly. We should look at that intelligently and see how to make it work for companies and for families. And the third is childcare. It's critically important. We think of the care infrastructure, childcare and elderly care as critical economic drivers of the economy. Because if we can have wonderful childcare, women can go back to work, dads can go back to work, and children grow up, you know, much more, uh, you know, uh, ready for school, if you want to put it that way. And if you really focus on elder care, a lot of women in particular who are staying home, taking care of their elderly parents or relatives can also come back to being in the paid economy. So if we think of care as a economic issue, not a political issue, I think we will come to a solution. So it's care, flexibility and predictability in your work schedules and paid leave. If we can somehow crack the code on that, boy, we, 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 we would fly as an economy more exactly. than we are today. And we're all hoping for that and working toward that. Perhaps the most talked about accomplishment of your tenure as CEO uh, was your Performance with Purpose Initiative, a universal mm -hmm. plan for change and corporate responsibility. Explain its directives and tell us what inspired you to take such action. The Performance with Purpose in its execution is very simple. Performance is performance. We have to deliver great financial performance. That's a non-negotiable because that's what's expected of companies like ours. But the world around us was changing in such profound ways that PepsiCo had to change. And that was our purpose, to change so that we could be successful into the future. On what dimensions? Our portfolio was heavily skewed towards what I call fun for you products. And we had to dial that up to have more better for you, which is zero calorie products or reduced fat, sugar, and salt products and good for you products, products that actually helped nutrition, like Sabra hummus or Tropicana juice or Quaker Roads. So by taking the fun for you products and reducing the salt and fat and sugar in the fun for you products, dialing up the zero calorie products better for you, and really dialing up the good for you is creating more balanced portfolio. That was the first plank of purpose because society was changing and it demanded that we change with it to future-proof the company. The second part of purpose was environmental sustainability, making sure that we reduce our water use, the amount of plastics we put out into the landfills or whatever waste uh, system, and our carbon footprint, because we had so many trucks on the road, we wanted to make sure we reduced our carbon footprint. So we had to focus on environmental sustainability. If we didn't do that, we would be taxed, or worse still, we wouldn't get a license to operate in many societies. And finally, if we don't have great people, PepsiCo cannot be successful. So the third plank was talent sustainability. How do we create an environment in the company where the best and brightest would come to work and remain 
committed to, to PepsiCo. So performance with purpose, if we delivered on purpose, we would keep performance going. If we delivered performance, we could fund purpose. It was a virtuous circle. And I believe when I came up with performance with purpose, it was a way to future-proof the company or de-risk it. You know, when you future-proof it, you de-risk it. It wasn't done with a view to saying, I've just got to do ESG because somebody told me I had to do it. I did it because it was the right thing for PepsiCo and we had to do it to make sure this company stayed successful well into the future. And it it has, and so many companies have followed your lead by, by instituting programs such as that and thinking about their companies in different ways, which brings me to your support of ethical capitalism, hearkening back to historic corporate foundations and moving away from modern corporate pr profit focus. How can that be achieved, though, Indra, with broad pay inequity and the widening wealth gap between workers and management? The first thing I'd say is, we should never give up the profit focus. It's the profit focus is supreme, it's paramount, it's uh, something we should all be focused on. What we've forgotten is in pursuing profits, we hollow out a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So it's the judicious balance of level and duration of returns. There's no point having huge returns for a couple of years and then collapsing. I think a better way to run a company is to have good returns over time, constantly reinvesting in the company so that you're building a sustainable enterprise over time. So this balance of level and duration is really the, the art form of running a company. Instead, many CEOs and boards choose to hit pedal to the metal and say, give me the maximum performance you can and run the company for the duration of the CEO, not the duration of the company. I think that's a big mistake. But what about the pay inequity? I think if you really look, conversations in board boardrooms and in companies have got to be about um, how do, are we sure we're taking care of our workers? Are we doing right by societies? Are we passing costs on to societies? Um, are we using the might of our reach and breath to make sure we send all our best practices out so societies and communities can get better? I think we should not forget that companies are sort of anchored in societies and a healthy society means healthy companies. And if we don't worry about our impact on society, I think companies' futures will be short-lived. And so I come back and say, CEOs have to think of their role as much bigger than how can I make a quick buck in the shortest possible time and everything else be damned. So it's a more holistic approach. Definitely, to... but it does not take away a focus on performance. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to family matters, which uh -huh. it does so much to you and to all of us here today. At the heart of much of your writing is family. Women still bear the lion's share of work and responsibility related to family. Yet you said, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, let's think about family matters like economists rather than making it a feminist. <clears throat> How can we do that? Well, it comes back to all of us saying to ourselves, we need families and family creation. We need children to be born because that's the future of the economy. We need the young people to pay into the pension system so the older people can get their social security checks. And we need young people to take care of the older people. So that's a virtuous circle, cycle that goes on in life. Um, but we have to sit back and say, we want the very families, especially the women who give birth to kids to also come back and work because they're so smart, they're driven, and they can be such huge contributors to the workplace. So how do I make both happen? Rather than tell families, you can choose between having a kid or coming to work. You tell, you tell them, it's not a choice. We're gonna give you all the support structures to allow, allow you to have a family, okay? But contribute to the paid economy too, because we need your talents. I mean, I'd say to you, Gina, today we're talking about the great resignation, but we actually have to shift this dialogue to saying, what is it going to take to go from the great resignation to the great re-enrollment? How do we get all the people who cannot come to work today because they don't have childcare or senior care and figure out a support system for them so that they can come to work? Because I think the net benefit to the economy is huge if we could do that. Tremendous. And like so many societies around the world, you grew up in a multi-generational family environment and then you built one stateside. 
Immigrants are bringing that structure to our shores. Explain the benefits and how we might encourage and fortify that model. You know, every time I talk about my multi-generational family, uh, people go, oh my God, I can't believe you lived under the roof, under your roof with you know, your mother, your in-laws, whatever it is. I'm like, I loved it uh, because everybody helped. It's not that they sat around and I did all the work. I would come home from work and the meal would be waiting and the kids are happy because they're with grandma, grandpa. And so I think our grandparents, these our parents, then feel like they have a role in life, a role in society. We benefit because they also end up being our helpers at home and take away all the burden of worrying about, oh God, I'm going home and I hope the kids are okay because the grandparents are there. And grandparents have a wonderful way of transmitting or, you know, traditions to young kids through stories, whatever. In fact, in places like Singapore, you know, there are now communities where they pay young people to live in a community where other older people live. So that on park benches, they see older people and younger kids sitting and talking. It helps the older person remain young. It helps the younger people be worry-free. So if we can get it in our hearts to say, yeah, you give up some by you know, having older people intrude in your life more or having these two or three people around you at the same time, Think about what you get in return. Exactly. I guess instead of it takes a village, we should say it takes a family. Takes a family, but I'd say the next part of it is many people don't have grandparents or parents to live with. And I think this is where we have to think about how to rebuild community trust so that we can support each other within a community, support each other, help each other out uh, so that we can say, hey, I've got a problem. Could you just watch my kid for an hour or two? I'll just go complete this issue and come back. So I think we have to think about communities and community trust very differently. I know that uh, my husband is from Germany. I know that in Germany, they're doing something similar to Singapore where they build communities around um, multi-generational living. Yep. So in one building, you'll, so it doesn't have to be exactly your relatives, but you will That's find right. that same kind of give and take. Yep. I'll help you, you'll help me. We all live in the same building. Let's set up schedules. And they actually have it managed in such a way that everyone can be a resource and find a resource. That's exactly right. If you have your own family, that's good. But don't think of it just as your family. Think of multi-generations, intergenerational responsibility. It's true. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful model. And we hope that it continues to grow here in the United States. Yeah. Um, I'm now going to touch upon uh, a section that I call uh, Indra, Up Close and Personal. Okay. I loved your book, and what I loved most was your commitment to tell your story honestly and courageously with intellect, kindness, and care. So I'm going to share some of your personal revelation, revelations from the book, and I invite you to comment or just smile. Okay. <laughs> In this, the 50th anniversary year of Title IX, I think people should know that you started the first female cricket team at your college and are the only female member of the International Cricket Club. I know, the Cricket Council. But you know, I'll tell you something. Cricket was religion in India. It was all men's cricket. And uh, it was just an awesome feeling to walk out into the field in the cricket whites and play the first intercollegiate match. And actually watch people cheering us, even though it was just family and friends, didn't matter. Even if it was 10 people, we were in the middle of the field and they were clapping for us. That feeling was fantastic. It gave you so much power and so much confidence. I can't even explain it. And so like me, you never learned to swim, but you love sports of all kinds. And yeah. you just learned so much about American sports and seem to love and enjoy them. Yeah, you know, I grew up with cricket, but ever since I came to the U.S. in 78, I fell in love with the New York Yankees. So I learned everything I could about them. I love American football. Uh, I haven't yet taken a liking to ice hockey because I don't like the ice. <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, it's, it's a very uh, fast game. I'm love, beginning to love soccer, basketball, American basketball. I love it. So I think all team sports, I love, really love it. And did that help you a little bit in the corporate world that was predominantly male and sports oriented often? In the early days, uh, sports was the language of business. 
Mm. So it helped. Every morning, everybody talks sports, what happened over the weekend. Nowadays, that's less so. But I think focusing on the team and looking at tapes of great players who were unselfish in, the, in their clutch moments is, you know, gave me a lot of lessons on how I should run my own company. How should I lead? When should I give as opposed to take? When should I share power? All that stuff. It gave me a lot of pointers. Sports fields are learning fields. Absolutely. Hello to our audience today, did you know that she loves music, that many of her favorite songs were sprinkled throughout the book, and that she played guitar in an all-girl rock band? Yeah, pretty bad one. But, was like, <laughs> <laughs> but in retrospect, but you know what? Those days when we were in the rock band, we were hot stuff because there wasn't <laughs> any other rock band in the late 1960s, early 70s, like our band. So. We were big, big deal in Madras. And so, um, you know, it, I don't care whether we were good or bad. The fact of the matter is when you get on stage and you have the confidence to perform, it builds your own confidence. It gives you great comfort that you can actually stand on stage with several hundred people in the audience and you can hold your own. So I think all these little steps, the cricket, debating, music, all gave me confidence and help me become the person I am today. Your mother remains a great influence. Could you yep. tell us today the touching story of leave your crown in the garage? <laughs> ah, I think 100% of people have heard it, but I'll say it again. It's one of those days in 2000 when I came back home very late after having been told I was gonna to be president and be on the board of directors of PepsiCo. And I was overwhelmed. I never ever dreamed of being the president of the company or being on the board of the company. It was a big step up for me. So I drove home at 10 o'clock in the night and I pulled into the garage. I saw my husband's car there already. And I, I walked into the house. My mother greeted me at the top of the stairs. And I said, mom, I got great news for you. She said, the news is going to have to wait. Go get some milk. So why me at 10 o'clock in the night? Why didn't you tell Raj to get the milk? He was here earlier. So well, he looked tired. Now you go get the milk. I went and got the milk and I said, Mom, couldn't you wait until I shared my big news with you? I'm going to become president of the company and be on the board of directors. And all that you want me to do is to get the milk. She just looked at me like I was nuts. And she said, I don't know what president is. I don't know what CFO. I mean, uh, being on the board is of PepsiCo and I don't care. When you walk into this house, you're the wife, the daughter, the daughter-in-law, the mother of the kids. So for heaven's sake, leave your crown in the garage and walk in. <clears throat> now, at that time, I was mad. Of course. But in rest retrospect, Gina, I think it was an incredible lesson on <clears throat> power and humility. Basically, what she was saying was, you can have all the power you want, but humility is what's going to allow you to be a good mother and park the power outside. But I think that message ought to be given to men and women. Family members should leave their power in the garage and come into the home and play the role of parents and spouses. I couldn't agree with you more. It was just so touching and, and so purposeful. <sighs> we'll take a page out of your mother's book for sure. Here's another. Did you know that you that your our guest today was a badge earning Girl Scout? Absolutely. Totally and completely, yes. I think that show sure was. And lastly, under did you know, you and your father suffered horrific accidents within long intensive care stays and long <clears throat> recoveries. How did that affect you? Uh, you know, I think my father's accident impacted me more than mine because I was so young and I adore my father, adored my father. And seeing him so... Um, beaten up and so many cuts and bruises, bones broken. There's a sight that still is etched in my head and I'm glad my father recovered fully, but I'll never forget that sight. My own accident, I didn't see a lot of my cuts and bruises because I was out of it. And all that I remember is that I had concussion and I had other issues that I had to work my way out of it. Uh, but I will tell you, when you're in a major car accident or whatever accident, it changes your whole perspective on how you drive, uh, how fast somebody else drives you around, the way they take turns, in a way that the drivers will never understand it. Because that accident still is etched in your head and when you somebody's going too fast, you go, don't. 
please don't because that those memories come back to you. So for uh, those who drive with people who are, you know, who are fast drivers and you've been through an accident, I hope those drivers understand that you still carry those memories with you. It doesn't matter how many years passes. And also, you know, we tell our children, do not drive with someone who's been drinking. The other yeah. thing has to be said, don't drive with someone who's driving too fast. Yeah. Tell them and get out. You don't, you yeah. have a choice. It's an important choice. Yeah, agree. Uh, we're drawing to a close of our conversation. I want to remind everyone who's here with us today, start to put in your questions and uh, in the Q&A box or the chat box, and I will get to them soon. So I'd like to close with um, the idea that the future is female. It's a phrase reborn during Hillary Clinton's presidential bid. Many embrace it, but many also deny the claim. What's your take? I go back to the statistics I quoted, Gina. If 70% of high school valedictorians are women and they're getting the college degrees and the professional degrees, and you want the most talented people in your company, you have to hire women because they're, they're kicking butt, if you want to call it that. They are really doing well. And I'm in awe of all these young women who just are focused and want to do the right thing, want to help society, want to be in community programs. I see so many young kids. And, you know, the boys and girls impress me, but the girls, the way they are driven to have economic freedom just wows me. Uh, and so I look at them and I go, if they are our future, okay, if we want to have a good future, they better be our future because they're so smart. And we're going to have to help them every which way so that they can contribute to the economy as well as produce the next generation so we can keep growing as a country. So I look at all of these young women, young girls, young women, I feel great about the future. At the same time, I just hope you all recognize that um, you don't want these people to not have families because they just cannot make all of this work, you know, juggling family and work. Let's make sure that we make it a choice for them as opposed to you know, hopeless uh, you know, trade-off between family and work. And to support families uh, of all types and all yep. descriptions would be included in that. I want others to know just how much you care. In fact, you use the word often to express not only your personal desire, but that for corporations to care, for workers to care about one another and for, si for society to care for all, particularly, as you mentioned before, as children and elders. Yeah. You had said that your focus going forward will be CARE, capital C-A-R-E, to help women advance. Yeah. And that CARE needs a moonshot approach. What's that mean? Well, I think um, we ought to think of solving for this CARE crisis, child care and senior care. How are we going to get guest workers or develop our own cadre of trained people who can take care of the young, take care of the, our seniors, um, and somehow pay for them so that they have living wages. Today, they, they're paid you know, pitiful wages. How do you give them the right income so that they don't have to moonlight as a grocery store clerk or in a coffee shop as a second shift uh, and still go home to two kids themselves? And so I think these care workers are in a very difficult situation today. So if we want to build this infrastructure, we've got to think of it almost like critical infrastructure for the country. Don't think of it as an optional infrastructure. Think of it as a critical infrastructure, like putting satellites up there or building fiber optics or railroads or, tra or uh, roads or bridges. If you think of it that way, you say to yourself, it's doable. If you said, oh God, care comes in the bottom of the pyramid because it's a woman's problem, it'll never get solved. So we've got to elevate it to moonshot status, bring all the innovation that we can muster to the table and somehow make it happen. An important and tangible infrastructure. In your book, you quote Janet Yellen saying, work lives and personal lives are inextricably linked. If one fail, so does the other. What measures not mentioned would you take to protect that duality? Well, I think of uh, the number of single women, uh, single mothers. And I say to myself, tell these people, they can choose between work life and home life. They don't have a choice. I think we have 
17%, I may be slightly off, but in the teens, single mothers, okay? And I look at that and I go, they don't have a choice. Many other families who are, you know, hourly workers who work in jobs where, you know, for productivity, their jobs have been cut or their wages reduced, don't have a choice but to come to work. So I'd really stop, you know, and pause and say to, my, say to ourselves, um, these are not choices we can make. For many, many people, they have to do both. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so let's not always put the privileged to think about this issue. Let's put the people who really need help in trying to make both work and come up with the solutions because they can ill afford to give up the job. They can um, ill afford to pay for expensive childcare that's not even available. At the same time, many of them also have an aging parent they're taking care of. And if we don't do something about this, Gina, we're gonna have a lot more women collapsing under mental stress. Exactly, yes. And mental health coming out of the pandemic is one of the greatest issues facing our nation today. I'd like to remind everybody, please get your questions in. I'm going to have one more for Indra before we take yours. Again, I'd like to end by quoting you, as you said in your book, I'm committed to give back to the state that has given so much to me and my family over the years. In what ways, Indra, past and present, is that commitment playing out? And how does Connecticut rank in terms of addressing the balance of lives and livelihoods for women? Actually, Connecticut is up there. We are one of the best states for women to work in. We are one of the best states for childcare. We have paid leave. Uh, the pandemic, of course, caused havoc even in Connecticut, but we've come out of it stronger, better. And I have to tell everybody on this call, Connecticut is a small, big state. It's a beautiful state. And the way we handled COVID, uh, the way um, we are more of a a centrist state without any extreme points of view. That's what makes Connecticut so wonderful. And I'd say in many ways, large parts of the Northeast are that way. And it makes, I mean, I feel privileged to live in Connecticut. Um, From my perspective, you know, I served as a co-chair of Reopen Connecticut post-COVID. I served as uh, the uh, co-chair of the Connecticut Economic Development Arm, the nonprofit arm not affiliated with government, but more with private enterprise to bring businesses to Connecticut. I finished the term and I'm still on the board now working to bring businesses to Connecticut. And to be honest, if I see any issues in Connecticut that need government attention, I make sure I call the right department and you know pass on these issues so they can go to work on it. And what's amazing about this administration is they actually go to work on it. Mm-hmm. Whether it's Beth Vi or any of the others, they go to work on it. So um, I think every citizen of this small, big state should have an incredible sense of ownership about the state, Um, thank ourselves for being in this state, and uh, do everything we can to keep the state as wonderful as it is. Well, it's apparent that you're happy with Connecticut, and without a doubt, Connecticut is happy with you. I want to, before, I'm going to take the questions now from the audience, but I just want to tell everyone who's on today, I'm going to start uh, to launch a poll, which is just six simple questions, which I encourage you all before you leave us today, would you kindly look at it because it helps us to plan food, future webinars and to move forward with exciting chats like this. So I'm going to begin. Indra, the first question. You're a role model for William, millions of women, but who's your role model? That's interesting. I don't have any one role model. For various things, I look at different people and say, God, I appreciate what this person does. I appreciate what person Y does. And it could be anybody from, uh, you know, an administrative assistant who's coping with so many problems, not making much money, yet comes smiling to work every day. Uh, or a leader who's on the attack constantly, but somehow has a backbone of steel and powers through these issues very uh, resiliently, if you want to use that word. So I look at all of these people and learn from them. And many are women. I also learn from men because I'm looking for the best example of somebody who's lived the experience that I'm trying to 
uh, you know, model myself after. So I look at ma many people as my role models and my mentors too. Uh, the next question is, in the face of rejections or constant disappointments, how did you or do you boost your motivation? That's a tough one. Uh, to be honest, I think in some ways I may have won the lottery of life because um, when I had rejections or disappointments, I always said to myself, what could I have done differently or done better? And I used failures as a learning moment. I went back to school and said, what did I do wrong? I relearn what I needed to do. I need to retool my approach and then go back and see how I can present my point of view. And usually after a couple of tries, I succeeded. I never tried, I never succeeded in the first try all the time. After a couple of tries, I succeeded. However, if I was in an environment where I was constantly disappointed or constantly rejected, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what I would have done. Um, if I had the ability to walk away because I was financially independent, that's one thing. But if I was not financially independent and I needed the job, I'd be very careful about walking away. So this is a dilemma. And I don't have a, I don't have a clean answer for this, except to say where you can use it as a learning moment, use it as a learning moment. Our next question says, hello, this was a great session. I have just one question. For an immigrant young woman, what is the key skill to fit into a leadership position? What should be one's approach in her development so that she could be in that position one day? I always say to people, make sure you understand what your proposition is that you're offering the company you're working for. Whether you're an immigrant or not, your proposition has to be crystal clear. What, are you, what, what does a company look upon you as a, as a contribution to the company? What skill do you bring? And how do you deepen that skill so it's always fresh? It's not that I used to be an expert in trade management five years ago, but I've lost touch with the skill. No, if you're an expert in trade management, people looked at you as the go-to person for that. How do you constantly expand your knowledge on trade management? So I think everybody has got to think about not your personal brand, your personal proposition. Mm -hmm. What can you offer the company? Keep it evergreen. And if you can fine tune a proposition that's also in the sweet spot of what the company needs, then people will value you and respect you enormously. The next question, I think you touched on it, but maybe um, it needs a little more reinforcement. It says, how did your advocacy and support for women and family become part of PepsiCo's culture, which I think we talked about with performance and uh, purpose, but she wants to know what worked really well and what didn't. Thank you for your time and insights. You are very inspirational. Uh, I mean, what worked was, you know, on-site, near-site childcare. We had paid leave, paternity, paternity care. We had some flexible hours all of that work, but we had not yet moved childcare into the factories, mm -hmm. especially in non-traditional hours. Mm -hmm. That requires some rethinking. You know, when you have three or four factories of different companies within a certain area, we should have all gotten together and said, how do we put in childcare yeah. for this bunch of factories so we get utilization out of the childcare. So it, like I said, it's a moonshot. I think we have to think about how can yeah. we make this all happen? This question is, how feasible is it to continue hybrid work and take advantage of the flexibility it provides while still maintaining a profit focus? I don't know. I don't know yet whether flexible and hybrid work leads to as good, if not better productivity than everybody coming to work, or does it actually, uh, is it actually detrimental to productivity? I don't know, I haven't seen the numbers. All that I tell you is that if everybody's going to work completely remotely, I don't know how you build corporate culture. I don't know how you do leadership development. I don't know how you get people to meet or meet one another. And my bigger fear, Gina, is that in a manufacturing company where all the manufacturing workers have to come in, rain or shine, they have to come on the shift. And if the office workers can work remotely, you're creating mm -hmm. two classes of workers. And that's what is me. No, should you should you be creating two classes of workers? Because the office workers get paid more than manufacturing workers and they get to work from wherever they want. And the manufacturing workers have to come to work rain or shine. 
Yes, there's still a lot to be said about the possibilities of uh, a new work place and the way that it will pan out. Uh, this one says, Indra, connect <clears throat> the diverse focus community. How would you go about to focus us more on areas of opportunity for business? Well, you know, Connecticut has become even more uh, business uh, focused because we have a businessman as a governor mm -hmm. and he's put in place lots of uh, uh, systems to encourage business. In fact, we are one of the few states where it's a one stop for everything. You know, you can go to one place and get all the help to open a business, to have business issues addressed. Like I said, we are the big, small state or the small, big state, whichever way we, you want to call it. We are small. And therefore, we can have these one-shot, I mean, one-stop, uh, you know, business uh, windows where you can actually go and start a business. And it's a great place to start a business because we have talent. We have incredible talent. We have 40 educational institutions of higher learning in Connecticut. We have an educated uh, populace that is second to none. We have a quality of, of life that's great. We have great medical systems. Uh, so I think Connecticut... Uh, you know, punches way above its size today. I know I've gone a few minutes over. I hope you'll forgive me, but I just want to get to a couple more questions. This one is not really a question. It just says a missed opportunity, which you're glad didn't work out. Oh, missed opportunity, which I'm glad it didn't work out. I'm glad I didn't stay as a cricketer. I'm glad I didn't stay as a rock musician. I would never <laughs> have made it. I would never have made it, although my heart might have been Happy in a different way. I'd be broke. I would be dead broke. Uh, and another one along those same lines, a brief example of how a failure shaped you and made you you. No, I've had many, many failures and setbacks in my life. There's not one failure that was major. Many, many across my life, personal, professional, all of that stuff. Um, I think failure induces humility. Uh, when you're thinking that you're the cat's whiskers, all of a sudden you have a big setback. Then you pause and say, you know, life's tough. Why should people walk on cloud nine all the time thinking that they're absolutely invincible? Nobody's invincible. Something is gonna happen around you that's gonna take you down a peg or two. So the best is be humble, be aware of the situation around you, be sensitive to other people and know that failure is part of success. And as long as you approach life that way, you can take failure in its stride and you can take success with the appropriate humility. Great answer. Uh, coming upon the last couple, we need more people in government who have a holistic approach to business and society. Have you considered running for political office? Absolutely not. <laughs> Politics requires a different sort of a person. I don't have those skills. <laughs> All right, and the last one is from one of our consulting scholars. It's just a comment. And she says, what a creative, accomplished, inspirational leader you are, dear Indra. Such great advice and wisdom to share with us. Thank you from Rosalind Amenta. And oh. I'd like to say thank you all for joining us today. This presentation, like all our webinars, will be uploaded to our website, cwhf.org, within a day or two as part of our educational programming platform. As I mentioned earlier, 2022 is the 50th anniversary of Title IX, which sparked a firestorm of females participating in organized sports within American academic institutions. On October 20th, we will induct four outstanding athletes at Connecticut's Convention Center in the state capitol. Join us for an unforgettable experience. Details and tickets at cwhf.org. And speaking of indu induction, let's all congratulate Indra on her upcoming induction uh -huh. to the National Women's Hall of Fame on September 24th, along such remarkable women as Mia Hamm and Michelle Obama, to name a few. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gina. And thank you to you for just being an extraordinary interviewer. Thank you. Thank you again for this important and illuminating chat. And I remind our guests before you go, please take a moment to answer our six poll questions. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Indra. Pleasure. Thank you, Gina. Bye-bye.
please before sure before you leave to fill out that poll and thank you again for joining us i look forward to seeing you soon in my next webinar Thank you everyone for joining us. I'll keep the webinar open until you've finished the poll questions. And once again, I look forward to seeing you again in the very near future. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for working on the poll. Thank you, everyone. I'm about to close the webinar. I see that Amanda and Susan are still on. If uh, if you have any objections to me closing the poll and the webinar, please let me know through the chat box. I think it may have been that you just didn't log out. So I will sign off and say thank you for joining us.